Um, the question is, could be a way that we could observe or get data from the first years of the universe? So the answer is, depends on the universe. <laughs> However, <laughs> those things where we're looking for the, the B mode polarization, that, would, that is something that would come from the first fraction of the second of the universe. So it depends on what information you want. You would like, you can only see back to the last scattering surface, which is about, you know, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. But if you're willing to go with the videos, you can see further back. If you're willing to go with gravity waves, you can see further back. If you're willing to go with polarization of the gravity waves, you can see even further back. So the answer is, what information do you want? Some of them we can actually reach. In principle, it might cost us a lot of money, but in principle, we can reach it. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Julio Alejandro Araujo, also from the Faculty of Earth and Space Sciences. He says, for an object to expand, it needs the space to expand. So the universe, where is it expanding? And if the answer is a thought, why is it existing? What is the, what is, I couldn't hear the last two words. Okay, it does a universe. And if the universe, and, and if the answer is a yes, why is it existing? And well, you say that there is a universe, and if you say, well, it has to be a universe. Why is it, does it exist at all? Okay, so that's a, this is a question about when you do science really carefully, hmm. a question like this, you have to define all your terms really well. You think, I know some science, I know Newton, F equals MA, right? Yes. What's F? What's M, what's A, what's E? People would pretty much know, but we have to define force. We have to understand what force is, we have to understand what mass and inertia are, and we have to understand what acceleration is. So when you say, why does the universe exist? There's a, first there's a why in there, which is hard to define, but the universe exists. Do you doubt that the universe exists? Well, only some of us. I mean, I think it's all quantum simulations. <laughs> and, and, but it doesn't matter because it's the universe to us, right? I mean, it's actually, so you go to a really great movie or you're in the Matrix, is it any different from the universe? Okay. 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 Y George contesto, contesto de que, que, qué es lo que quieres buscar y cuál es el, el, el medio que vas a usar. Entonces, si vamos con neutrinos, vas más atrás, si vamos con ondas gravitacionales, vas más atrás, pero en cada una de estas etapas es cuál es el mensaje que estás buscando. Y en esta segunda pregunta es por qué existe el universo, George dice que podríamos ser una, una, una simulación cuántica. Y o oh, los que nos han visto de Matrix, ¿no? Podríamos estar en The Matrix y la, la pregunta es si podemos distinguir en cuál, cuál es cuál. Ok. I have another question from Alexis Castro. He says, if the universe is accelerating, what is the probability that something is pushing it or pulling or is being pulled by something or something? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, no. <laughs> so, this is a, a question that actually I find students can understand, so that's good. A question I didn't think they'd have trouble with, but one that everyone has trouble with, is how can there be any in time? What was there before there was time, right? But there was no before, right? How can you just start time at equal zero rather than going to minus infinity, right? Because wherever you have it, then you relabel to equal zero. Students are unable to understand how time could start. 
the students can understand how there's nothing north of the North Pole, but they can't imagine that space-time is rolled over so that there comes a place where you cannot go back in time, you only go forward in time. And so you now can start realizing the power and the weakness of general relativity mm. is that with general relativity you can change your variables and you can change what space-time looks like, you can change your life, pretty much everything. In the early days, there were big arguments about whether there were gravity waves at all, and Einstein was involved in them. The famous paper that he wrote was with the Podolsky. Yeah, with the No, but not, not the ER one, the other, there's one before that, in which he, which he says, we don't think gravity waves really exist and they can't carry any momentum. Because in the end, the test that we have is, is in a way, it doesn't carry energy momentum from one place to another place. And it turned out that from general relativity, using the coordinates that they were using, they found several things that looked like gravity waves, but they weren't gravity waves. They were, they were just strange mathematical solutions. The equations are actually way richer in possible results than you would imagine, because you're, you're, if you've been blessed with your life, you never got that differential equation, that algebra differential equation, and they're always solutions. Right? Well, almost always solutions. And so it's a, it's a situation you have to be careful. That's why I say you have to really define you know, what information you want and what coordinates you're looking at. Because you're proponent, as a human, you're proponent to have, or you're likely supposed to have prejudices, what the answer is and what you go on. And when you work through these difficult equations, you get the wrong answer. Name the one you like, and that it, that happens over and over again. That humans get the answer they like as opposed to the answer they would get if they were thinking carefully and clearly. Okay, may I continue? Yes. For the next question. Go ahead, please. Yep. Okay. okay. He says, "Could exist a limit for the expansion of the universe?" Uh, that means if in any time. Any, any moment in time, the universe will stop expanding. Well, the people running the simulation can turn the computer off. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is, will the universe stop expanding or not? And the answer is, given what we know of the laws of physics and the behavior, then it, will, it will slowly, it won't just abruptly stop and say, all right, time's up. It will just, it will start making a transition into other things, and you know. So we want we we want to know if dark energy is really a constant, right? Or is it something that can undergo a phase transition, and that many that <laughs> and and so. The question is, you know, what is the dark energy made out of? It determines the future of the universe. It's now 70% of the universe. If the universe keeps expanding the way it is, it'll get to be a bigger factor. And the time will come, you know, when it dominates the universe, if it should make a transition from being dark energy to negative pressure to being a different form of energy, with the positive pressure, you turn around and the expansion universe will slow down. And things will be different. And that's relevant. If you want if you ask the question, can life exist forever? The answer is if the universe keeps accelerating the expansion, the answer is no, because you'll run out of food mm -hmm. energy energy is what that you will get less and less energy in your sphere of influence until you have enough at all. And there's no way around that. But if the universe is slowing down and going to collapse again, you could go on for a long time until you get crunched. So, you know, but it's not good to ask these really long-term questions when you might have a only short-term You have no problem thinking about it. 
Okay, that's it. Okay. Uh, we have a student from India, and he wants to ask some question. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Hello, sir. Hello, everybody. So it's an honor to have you here, and what a timeline that you and I were in the same place, same time, I would say. So yeah, I'm a PhD student uh, in Faculty of Art and Space Science, and I currently work on earthquake precursor de detection, basically in the San Andreas Fault, expanding towards the northern Mexico. So it's a very interesting uh, presentation I even attended yesterday. And my question for today is like, uh, in one of your slides, you have give our, I mean, it was written that the age of the universe is 13.6 billion years. But there is a recent research published by Dr. Rajendra Gupta from India, from the University of Ottawa. He said that the age of the universe is almost double. And it is not he claimed, he strongly even proved the evidence and it has been published in Royal Astronomical Society. So according to him, the age of the universe is 27 billion years. So what is your opinion on that? And as a general audience, which one shall I believe? <laughs> because I believe research, uh, I mean... I would say time will tell. Okay. But I think the universe is only about 14 billion years old. That's at least our part of the universe. The universe is very big. So our part, that may be hundreds of times this as we can see, our part has been around effectively the space time and a great fraction of that, maybe even a little bit came in, has been around just about 14 billion years, and it will be around probably 100 billion years, and then we'll see what happens. It's not to say there are no other places in the universe which are inaccessible to us, and will probably remain inaccessible to us indefinitely, that are even older. You can imagine universes in which, you know, there are like vines with, with watermelons growing on it. Every now and a watermelon grows. And you have to live in the middle of a watermelon, your little bug. So you only see water, red watermelon meat around you. And you think that's the universe, right? But there's a whole vine and a whole bunch of other watermelons. It can be very complicated. We don't know. As a scientist, we often try models that are both very simple and that we can calculate. And so I gave to my course students a problem which I will give to all you students now. Think about the universe, simplify the universe the same way the Dreamman did to where you have spherical symmetry and everything. And start out with a universe that's nothing. No energy, no whatever, nothing and tumble from that universe, bottom candy, tumble to that, to a universe that is physically large, or physically reasonable size, maybe 10 to the minus 20 centimeters, 10 to the minus 10 centimeters, reasonably big, and then it's in a period of inflation, so it can grow to be really big. Right? Can you write down the equation to do that? And the answer is, yes you can, one of the solutions is the sum of area functions. Depending on what coefficient you pick in the area functions, you get different universes. And this is something a you know a junior, perhaps a sophomore, can do because they've had different equations or something. Like that. You can do these calculations, and it's very straightforward. And it's a solution that's existed for mathematicians since the 1800s. I forget when area was around, but and so. That's a simple answer, right? You can do your estimate and see what answer you get and say, oh, well, this is pretty good. This is good. This is, you know, this other guy's estimate. Because what, what did he have to do to make the cycles and make the universe extra long or whatever? Because you could make the universe, it means it's been longer by having a loitering phase. You can have a phase where it spends a bunch of time in a really hot, dense state and doesn't do much to loiter around, let, let the aeons go by and so but if you don't want to put a lot of extra stuff in, it's going to go whoosh and pop up big, right? It's, it's uh, a thing. And so this has to do with the philosophy of science and the philosophy of being an operating scientist. 
what do you do? You make the minimum assumptions, and you make a model, and you see if it fits over there. Right? Now, you might say that's less than perfect. And the answer is science is less than perfect. But the thing about science is we can go out and make the observations and try and see if we can break the model or we need to do a better model. Right? And so it's a, I don't see that we want to go to an expert and have them tell us what the answer is. I think that what we want to go to a book and do that. So I am reminded that some years ago I went to a Vatican school meeting which was on the 40th anniversary of Galileo. And I thought, I can't miss this because they were going to take it out of the vault Galileo's or the work he had for his trial to hand in a copy of everything he ever published so that they could go and review his life. And so. so they had all the original stuff, all his original work. You know, these beautiful illustrated you know, books and all this kind of stuff. And when I was there, they had people from the religious side, the theologians and the religious side, and they had people from the philosophy side, and they had sort of astrologists on their side. All the religious people and the uh, philosophers were very worried about the future of their subjects. Mm. They said, if you go back 2,000 years, there were way more religious people than scientists. They were a big, powerful group, and the philosophers were a big, powerful group. We, we still worship Greek philosophers, right? I mean, we still think they were great guys. What scientists from the Greek times? Well, there were, there were fewer than those guys, but there was a few, like they were, but not so many. But now, in the present world, up until, or up until recently, the scientists have respect. People have results. The medicine work, the scientific theories work, the vaccines work. People respected science and looked to it as a story and whatever else. And they were not doing that so much to philosophy and religion. And the reason that I thought one of those things was true is science goes out and you have a whole, you don't just have one book you read over and over again. Or you don't have just a few authors giving you ideas. You're going out to nature and doing tests on nature. You have a really big book to see what's going on. And you can do that. And as long as scientists are doing their job right, they will get better and better approximation to understanding what's going on. What happens is, we, like, like the philosophers and, and the theologians, we'd like to know the truth with a capital T rather than the truth with a small t that lets us calculate stuff and make estimates. And so, do you really want to know how old the universe is, or do you want to hang around and check it out? I mean, no, what, what if you are wrong? What if the, the book is wrong? I mean, what if the conventional methods that they were using to, to check, or let's say the Hubble's telescope is wrong? I mean, uh, let's, let's assume, for, for, for one point of time, let, let's assume Rosetta Cruz is right. And will that change the, the world? Like, maybe everything would be double. The age of the Earth will be double. The age of the sun, the, the moon. So the answer is, we try and do our experiments so that there are cross-checks. There are other independent groups who are doing that. It's a big problem in I use physics because you have only one big accelerator, and though you have two detectors, I mean, our forefathers were, four were, were smart enough, and you know, the forefathers, four mothers, they said, we got to have two independent experiments, and, but it's really hard to keep the postdocs from talking to each other. But two postdocs talking to low level each other can support the independence of experiments. So, you know, in science, you're supposed to have people check your stuff. So, Jorge Teller and I just wrote this paper about the Hubble controversy. And our argument is that history has been scientists make mistakes just like everybody else. But you're in a field where you're supposed to check them. And you can't just come in and claim that it's wrong. You've got to show why it's wrong, and you've got to show why what you're doing is right. And this guy hasn't done that, so we've never heard about it. Yes, he did. Okay, so thank you so much.
Thank you, sir. We have another question from. Are you student teacher? <laughs> Hello. My name is Annalisa and I'm a researcher and professor here in the university. Thank you for being here. My question is, okay, we know all the most important proof that we have that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic comes from the CMB radiation. But uh, as you show, uh, the CMB radiation also have fluctuations. And so this is no homogeneous and isotropic at all. And so what happened with the Hover constant or another cosmological parameters if we suppose that the universe is not homogeneous and isotropic? Okay, this is actually, in principle, an easy question, but it has to do with the fact that people are used to doing perturbation theories. That is, the universe is definitely not isotropic and homogeneous on the small scale, but it definitely is on the large scale, right? So you can do the tests, you can see the independence. Remember the perturbations that we see are 10 to the minus 5 level and smaller, okay? So I can say the solution to the geometry of the universe is isotropic homogeneous plus perturbations, a number of perturbations at 10 to the minus 5 level. Now, can those perturbations at 10 to the minus 5 level change the answer about the nature of the universe we're in? And the answer is, because they're so small, their perturbation effects are linear, there's no great nonlinear effect that's going to come and flip the universe over or do anything like that. And, uh, but I knew this to be the case intuitively. So there is a, a thing called EGS. It's Aaron cares. Okay. It sucks. EGS oh, there. Sucks. Yes. That if you have a graduate student who observes the cosmic microwave background for sucks. ever, sucks. yeah, sucks. Sucks. the EGS there. If you observe, if you have a graduate student who observes the universe to be isotropic for all time, that is a really long lasting thesis. You're sampling the universe at further and further and further distances. And if that's the case, that you show it's isotropic through all of time, then the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. And my instinct was, for my math guys, which I did a fair amount of this, I got a yes in math as well. The, you could prove an almost EGS theorem. It took me three or four years to convince the <laughs> Was Hawkins, uh, Ellis, George Ellis, and, and Stover, and to actually write the paper. So you can take and write down the situation for what you see, what the scale of the perturbations are, and look to see can you flip the universe over into being homogeneous and non And The answer is not at the, you know, a couple times to the minus five. You're pretty much stuck back as far as you can see, and you don't have to make your grad student observe forever. It's just enough if she observes for a while. Right? And, and it's even better if you could have two grad students that are far apart, and then they're going to do the operations, and then you actually have overlapping, overlapping samples of what's going on to prove home today. So the answer is yes, because you would wonder what these people used to do when I was really young starting out. They used to do the Bianchi types of the universe. I don't know if you remember this or not. So there are a whole bunch of things where there are different kinds of possible geometries or constructions of space time. And uh, there are nine or ten Bianchi types, and it's like A, you know, 9A and 9B. Like, there, there are a whole bunch of different possibilities. And they give you very different answers in long range. Most of those are ruled out. You can only, only if you, you know, put some extra strange kinds of energy in the universe, right? Universe, the energies that we don't know about now, things that have allowed time travel and a bunch of other things that are not necessarily good for, for the um, you're, you're basically having trouble 
really making the universe a lot different from the universe we have. But you're right, there are perturbations, and those perturbations have to be taken into account. But there are people who are trying to solve the Hubble constant by saying we live in a, in a, in a, in a kind of a little bumble that's less dense than usual. Well, that's stretching, I mean, it may be true, but they're still stretching a lot to do, to fix the Hubble with the discrepancy. The Hubble discrepancy, my guess is, people have made mistakes. And they're going to get caught. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't show the plot, I didn't. Maybe, maybe I showed it yesterday. The plot of the, of the speed of light versus time and the plot of the Hubble concept. Did the, did the speed of light change that much over 100 years? Or was the people? Did the Hubble constant change that much over the last 30 years, or is it the people? It's probably the people, but we'll see. It's very, very hard for humans to admit they are consistently getting wrong answers. Right? That they have to guard tremendously against getting wrong answers. And everybody thinks they're a great driver, whereas almost everyone would be beaten by you know, a Waymo car. It's, it's a, you know, we, we know that 90 something percent of them will be worse than a Waymo driver, a Waymo car, driverless car. So humans consistently, and because of evolutionary effects, make wrong judgments. I, I have a, one more question. Thank you for your beautiful talk. Um, it, it's more about the, this uh, quant, um, quantum computer, uh, the universe as a quantum computer. Um, there is also the, this interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, many words, that was favored by Hartzell, by Wheeler, the, the Wheat, uh, and many more. Uh, they have this, uh, all those concepts have, have turned to be uh, about quantum computer, quantum information, the coherence, and uh, von Neumann entropy. Do you consider that this approach is uh, different than many words interpretation? I think 90 some percent of the people who are working on quantum computing are using a hybrid traditional view of quantum mechanics. Just ask Alice and Bob. They'll tell you. <laughs> For those who don't know, that's an inside joke. <laughs> and uh, the issue is sort of I, I am one of the people who, when I think about, I was taught a different way. But when I think about it, I think that it was Wheeler student who came up with the many worlds. What's called the many worlds interpretation, but people misuse the many worlds stuff. What he was saying is, you never decohere the wave function. You never collapse the wave function. It just, you know, you, if you're doing quantum computing, all you're doing is choosing a particular path that you move down. The rest of the world is taking a different path, or some other parts of the world taking a different path. So all those possibilities still exist. It's like the carrier's cat being dead and alive, or wanted dead and alive. It, you know, there is some, some parts of the reality where his cat's alive and some parts of the reality where it's dead. And yes, right, that's okay. So quantum computing is, uh, is a very complicated thing because most of the cat are in such a way. So if, if Alice and Bob pre-recognize a code by putting entangled quantum systems together, they can in principle, do a cloning. They can they can defeat the no cloning theorem, right? Because they agree ahead of time what the quantum state is going to be. And if you see one member of the quantum state, so they send you, if Alice sends to Bob, this is the result I got. Simple knows the digital message. He knows how to set the quantum state. Right? So that the no the, the the no cloning thing doesn't say you can't clone. It says you can have it, you can destroy it in one place and reconstruct it in another place. You can't make an identical copy at the same time. You've got to keep the total information fixed. That's certain, certain. So the answer is, is 
quantum computing and then cloning and everything. It's way more subtle than it looks. <laughs> so that's why you should do good on the exam, right? <laughs> um, hello, I am Manuel. I am professor of astronomy here in the university. Thank you for your amazing talk. So I wonder about the Sunjaev Seldovich effect uh, because of the, all the map that you show uh, for the CMB. Uh, can, can, can we observe this effect on the CMB map or only in the spectrum of, of the CMB? So I more than ran out of time, but you can see the Sunjaev Seldovich effect in the map. So for people who don't know what it is, Sunjaev I worked with a really great Jewish-Russian physicist named Zelkovich, and uh, who I got to meet once. And he was let out of, of the Soviet Union just briefly, and, and so forth. And, and I was shocked because he knew who I was, and I was just a kid. <laughs> because I had an experimental result, which he was very interested in. So. But the KBG guy came and took him away. And, but, Sanyayev I know quite well, he spends a lot of his time in the West now because the Soviet Union pulled it up and the, the pay to Russian professors is not so good. Uh, and right now it's not so good to be in Russia at all. The, the sun, they recognize at an early time, thinking about these problems, that if you sent the CMD photons through a galactic cluster, like the lensing cluster that I showed you, the cluster medium is mostly dark matter, but there is a lot of gas in between, but the gas will be very hot because the orbital velocity is in the hundreds of kilometers per second, two or three hundred kilometers per second. Collisions between gas molecules make them ionize. So there are many fleer electrons out through the galaxy cluster, so when the photons come through, they have a high probability because the cross the Thompson cross section, or the Thompson cross section, is quite large. So they have a high probability of doing. So for rich cluster galaxies, it's on the scale of a tenth percent, or even one percent, of the photons going through the cluster will be scattered. When they scatter, the aerodynamics, statistical the mechanics, tell you the electrons are hotter, CMB photons. On average, they will scatter those photons not only an angle, but also to higher energies. And so you can see this on the Zodovich effect, because here's the cosmic background Planckian curve, but now it's distorted because some of the bulk photons are now moved to higher energy and or scattered to different angles. So when you're looking, a cluster of galaxies will look a little darker, but it will have a little hot tail on its radiation. So you can map that if you have sufficiently good experiments. And so people do that, and there are maps of pieces of the sky in which you see the sun you have the effect. And you're even looking for second order effects because you can have an effect from the fact the cluster of galaxies is moving. That's a different than just being hot. So there are different things that can happen. You can try and measure those. Some of those, like the temperature difference, are quite well measured, and there are maps like that, but they generally cover only a small part of the sky because people haven't put big telescope arrays, radio telescope arrays in, making these measurements more than a little bit. I mean, it was a big deal to get a few hundred of these, but that's all that people have really done so far. Okay, so in this, in this map, these effects is removed in the map that you show. Well, you get to choose, you get to choose what data you pick, and you do that. What I, what I, the maps I showed you were on an angular scale in which these guys would be small and you average over them in general. Or you, you remove them some, there are some corrections, but yeah. There are some much more high relative maps when I was showing you the peak at seven, seven and eight peaks. That's starting to be in the region where you have to make the correction for some of the other Okay, the, the last one. Um, here in the university, we have the only bachelor program in astronomy in the country, so there are many young students uh, students here of astronomy, and I would like you to 
to ask you to give them uh, another advice in order to keep uh, studying and working in this field of the of the science. Please. Do you want some advice for the new, the new for the young, young students? The students of, of astronomy here is the only bachelor's program in the whole of, of Mexico. All of Mexico. The whole of Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. This is the only the second time something like happened to me. You know, I tried to do a lot of encouragement of education for science and something, and we found out there was not a single high school teacher in Nigeria that taught science. Here's a whole country, and there's not a single science teacher from any high school anywhere. So we finally found the teacher, and we brought her to the United States to help train her, and we helped her uh, get connected with the hands-on astronomy project so that they can actually have students use robotic telescopes to make observations themselves because people learn better with hands-on. So why would you want to do astronomy? What's out there? You know, the answer is you guys want to be an astronomer because you love doing astronomy, because you want to know what the universe is like. So the best thing to do is keep your excitement and interest up in the field, but also get Omar to work extra hard because with, with, with Axel and Jorge, uh, we used to run, and people to be Berkeley, we used to run cosmology on the beach, which was to do aspects in cosmology and to have roughly half of the people be people from Mexico, and the rest were from Europe and the United States and a little bit from more southern America. And uh, that was a very good way, A, for people to hear about the latest research, because we run a school, we bring in very good lecturers and so forth. And uh, we also would have a session where the students either had to give a talk or give a poster and present their poster. And we gave them a prize for the best talk and for the best poster and so forth. And uh, the problem is, I and my colleagues got busy with other things and got tired. It's a fair amount of work to put these on. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, so, if you guys want to make sure you have contact with the rest of the world, that's the way, by having those schools, that is the way a lot of people in the field got to know people from other countries and got to know about the other projects that were going around Mexico. And we created the Institute of Events on Cosmology and managed to convince the, the funding agency to give some money to it each year. And that paid for part of the school. I got money from NSF. That's why we had it called Essential Technology for Next Generation. But that sounds a lot better than NSF and Technology on the Beach. <laughs> and we could not pay for alcohol. <laughs> of certain senators being in Quito. So we could pay for airfares or we could pay for something. We couldn't we could go home. Oh, so the fact is, there are things you can do to give you contact with the rest of the world. But I don't know how can we have an astronomy department here where you're not on top of a mountain. <laughs> they, they do have an observatory. You have an observatory? Where is the observatory? Is it in Baja or no? Or we want to take you there. Two hours and a half. That's a teaching observatory. It is. What, what do you have for a research observatory? Oh, the National Observatory. Right? Yeah, so they got to fly across country. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you allow me, I'd like to make a commercial. Okay, then. Make the commercial. This is, this is brought to you by Omar. <laughs> Bueno, ya, ya que estamos aquí eh, y que está el, el, el vicerrector y toda la, la gente importante de la universidad, cada año en el INOAE, Wenceslao nos ha estado mandando estudiantes de, eh, de aquí de la, de la facultad para hacer un verano en el INOAE. En, en Yo estaba pensando que podríamos hacer ese verano aquí. O sea, desde que en lugar de mandar a los chamacos hasta allá, viniéramos los profesores aquí y hiciéramos algo. Eso puede ser y podemos atender a más gente. O sea, toda la clase la podemos meter en un verano 
y el, el resultado es de que van a presentar un póster para el Congreso Nacional de Física cada uno de los o grupos de tres chamacos entonces yo creo que esta es una buena oportunidad ¿no? para no nada más traer a un gran investigador y que vea que es de carne y hueso que es, es, es igual que bromea igual que todos pero es, esto es muy importante yo creo que verse o como lo que hubiéramos dado Yanina o cualquiera de nosotros cuando éramos estudiantes locales ¿no? como universitarios que hubiera venido un Nobel en esos tiempos hubiera sido maravilloso Okay, George, I made my collection. Thank you very much. So I will explain to you what I did.